to this uh, to this event, remembering Nagasaki on the 9th of August. And I'm just going to start with my own brief reflection. The campaign for nuclear disarmament will always remember the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the lives lost, the unimaginable suffering and harms that have been passed down through generations. And the testimony of the survivors, those brave testimonies, remind us about the immediate official US, UK response, allies response, included an attempt at secrecy. The immediate official research was for military purposes, really not to help victims or restore the environment. And then there was the self-serving myth of how the bombings, these two bombings ended the war and saved lives. Then the US-UK leadership mindset was a, a self-fulfilling presumption of an arms race. Within 10 months of Nagasaki, the United States began nuclear tests in the South Pacific, choosing the fragile biodiverse ecosystem of a coral atoll, shattering lives in the Marshall Islands, treating people there as lesser value than US personnel. And then four years later, the Soviets began testing in Kazakhstan and another three years, it was the British in Australia. More colonial racist disregard for indigenous people, more human suffering. We hear only anecdotes of the fates of species other than humans, blinded birds, screams of burned animals, beaches littered with dead turtles, miles of floating dead fish. And science is only now revealing the harms we did then to the weather. The realities of climate emergency very much in the news today now force world leaders to recognize the whole fragility of our planet and survivors like Setsuko Thurlow have worked with ICANN to help to create the treaty that is a legal mechanism now not only for banning all nuclear weapons but at last for making reparations for nuclear uh, harms. So I'm now immediately going to hand over to Peter Clive for a reading August the 9th, 1945. Thank you. August 9th, 1945. The sky inhaled the earth today. <laughs> At 11 a.m. the cloudy Kyushu sky breathed in. It sucked the air up through a long, sore, smoky throat into a lung of fire. And when it finally breathed out, it raised the city up on its palm and pursed its lips and blew away the ashes of our bones. Thank you, Clive. I'm now going to ask Bill Kidd, um, who is the MSP, and convener of the cross-party group on nuclear disarmament in the Scottish Parliament to give his reflections. I'd like to thank you, <clears throat> pardon me, I'd like to thank you very much for that. Um, uh, friends, um, thank the Scottish CND for kindly inviting me to address this gathering and all of us actually uh, this evening and recognising the 76th anniversary today of the bombing of Nagasaki. I can mention that I I also bring greetings from PNND, that's Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, which I'm proud to serve as a co-president, and also Abolition 2000, of which I'm a Global Council member. And we're here in memory of all of those lost in the bombings of Hiroshima on August the 6th and Nagasaki on August the 9th, 1945. We must also keep in our thoughts at all times the survivors, the Habakusha, who have lived with the pain of loss, but with dignity over all these years, many of whom have travelled the world, many of the Bakusha, to this day, reminding us all of the terrible doom which was visited upon their cities and their families 76 years ago. In the Scottish Parliament, we've been honoured to welcome Habakusha groups on a number of occasions, and they have always represented the Japanese people and the people who have been lost in a kind and courteous and friendly and informative manner. 
These days, thankfully, Japan is a friend of Scotland and we should stand together across the world in this time of remembrance. So we're here in Scotland and we here in Scotland and our Scottish Government and across the Scottish Parliament and as a cross-party group on nuclear disarmament have an honourable tradition of standing up and speaking out for a nuclear weapons-free world and for a global peace where peoples of all lands can live and work together with the aim of building a better world for all of our citizens. I'm going to give a short message here from the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. And Nicola Sturgeon says, my commitment to a world without nuclear weapons has been unshakable since I first joined CND as a teenager in the 1980s. And the need for nations and governments to work together to secure a safer, more peaceful world is as great now as it was then. And this memorial event from Scottish CND is an important reminder of the horrors of nuclear warfare. I was previously privileged to meet some survivors of the 1945 bombings who are known as the Habakusha when they visited the Scottish Parliament. My best wishes go to all of those attending the memorial event as we look towards a world free from nuclear weapons. I know for a fact that is the feeling of everyone looking in here today, and I know it's a strengthening feeling across Scotland. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> I'm now asking um, Jerry Luce to give us uh, a reading, please. Um, thank you. It's, um, I can't say it's a pleasure, but it's a privilege to be here this evening. Um, in the year 2000, I set out to walk in various landscapes, the desert landscapes of the United States, where the atomic bombs were tested. And then I moved on to Japan. Um, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki to see for myself how those cities had coped, recovered. I spoke to many people along the way. I wrote a book called That Person Himself, which details all of this. It's a book, it's a book length poem. And um, I'll read a passage from the end of the book. Within this book, I incorporate the testimonies of both Hibakusha and um, people who survived the atomic fallout in the desert states themselves. The last, passage, the last passages in the book are drawn directly from the statements and some people I spoke to, uh, some Hibakusha I spoke to. 11 a.m. In the morning of August the 9th, Prime Minister Kintaro Suzuki addressed the Japanese cabinet. Terminate the war. One bluish-white, bluish-red, white, greenish-yellow sun. So strong that all living beings had been turned to powder. There were no corpses to be seen, as if blue morning glories had suddenly bloomed up in the sky. It began to rain. The fire and the smoke made us so thirsty and there was nothing to drink, no water. As it began to rain, people opened their mouths and turned their faces towards the sky and tried to drink the rain, but it wasn't easy to catch the raindrops in our mouths. It was a black rain with big drops. They were so big that we even felt pain when they popped, dropped onto us. We opened our mouths just like this, as wide as possible in an effort to quench our thirst. I felt I was entirely covered with only three colors. I remember red, black, and brown, but, but nothing else. The fingertips of those dead bodies caught fire, and the fire gradually spread over their entire bodies from their fingers. A light gray liquid dripped down their hands, scorching their fingers. I, I was so shocked to know that fingers and bodies could be burned and deformed like that. Hands and fingers that would hold babies or turn pages, pages. They, just, they just burned away. Her skin was just peeling right off. The maggots were coming out all over. I couldn't wipe them off. I thought it would be too painful. I picked off some maggots though, and nine hours later she died on my lap. She said, I don't want to die. I told her, hang on, hang on. She said, I won't die before my brother comes home but she was in pain and she kept crying, brother, mother. 
I joined the White Chrysanthemum Organization, pledging to donate my body upon death for medical education and research. My registration number is number 1200. I'm ready. I held him firmly and looked down on him. He had been standing by the window, and I think fragments of glass had pierced his head. His face was a mess because of the blood flowing from his head, but he looked at my face and smiled. His smile had remained glued in my memory. He did not comprehend what had happened, and so he looked at me and smiled at my face, which was all bloody. I had plenty of milk, which he drank all throughout that day. I think my child sucked the poison right out of my body. And soon after that, he died. Yes, I think that he died for me. And a woman whose eyeballs were sticking out, her whole baby was bleeding. A mother and her baby were lying with skin completely peeled off. Another friend of mine. I wondered why the soles of his feet were badly burned. It was an undeniable fact that the soles were peeling and red muscle was exposed. Even I myself was terribly burnt. I could not go home ignoring him. I made him crawl using his arms and knees. Next, I made him stand on his heels and I supported him. We walked heading towards my home, repeating the two methods. When we were resting because we were so exhausted, I found my grandfather's brother and his wife. In other words, great uncle and great aunt coming towards us. They seemed to be Buddhas wandering in living hell. They were helping each other, but they were barely making their way. I cried. These were mounds. If I tried to find my beloved ones, I would have to remove the bodies one by one. There were all kinds of bodies in the mounds, not only human bodies, but bodies of birds, cats and dogs, and even that of a cow. I can't find words to describe it. They were burned, just like human bodies, and some of them were half burnt. There was even a swollen horse. Just everything was there. Everything. How? How can I say it? Thank you. I think I'm now going to ask Kenneth Wardrop, who's the chair of Stirling CND, to give some reflections. Thank you, Lynn. A, on Friday evening, as Stirling CND member, members gathered at the Peace Garden in Bridge of Allen for our annual Hiroshima and Nagasaki Day commemoration, as we've done for over 30 years, a, we reflected that we were drawn together by our hopes for peace as an alternative to conflict and war, striving for cooperation, reconciliation and harmonious coexistence between peoples of different race, religion and creeds. As ever, we were all focused on the events in 1945 in Hiroshima and Nakasaki, especially in the wake of the experience we've all gone through with the COVID-19 global uh, pandemic which we all agreed has heightened our awareness of the vulnerability of humanity, uh, the importance of community, and our own concerns for personal safety and the realities of global society and the mutuality of our coexistence. In our reflections, we focus on the horrors of the use of nuclear weapons in the communities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that fear and threat and the finality of the use of those nuclear weapons and the fact that we've lived with this over the past 76 years. But we were also encouraged by our collective drive for nuclear disarmament and peace as an objective that continues to be worth pursuing. And especially so with the progress with the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which we see as a beacon to encourage us in our own ongoing peace campaigning. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. And now uh, George Colquito will read Nuclear Warning. Thank you. Nuclear Warning. My great uncle barely knew nuclear war. He died before the Cuban crisis. I see him teach me cards, how to link numbers, 
I see him smile. We never discussed how to frazzle a million people. We never wondered if the bomb had secured Western democracy. He laughed and lifted me, he gave me love. Tomorrow when the bomb lands, unscrew the kitchen door, lay it over the table. We have four minutes to create a shelter. Kiss your sister goodbye. And now I'm going to ask Caroline Uchima um, of Alton Peace Sanctuary and Dumfries and Galloway at CND for her reflections. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, feeling very moved at the moment. Um, so Al Alan's and Peace Sanctuary was actually born out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's one of three sanctuaries around the world, the first one being at Mount Fuji in Japan. And I lived in Japan for about 20 years before I came back here to work at Allenton Peace Sanctuary. But what really, really touched me about the Japanese people was um, that after this incredible, indescribable, uh, you know, these events at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they, they didn't, of course, that it was n never again, of course, but they started to focus on how do we create a peaceful future. So to look for solution rather than poisoning or becoming um, uh, just embroiled in, you know, the pain of the past. So um, when I was in Japan, I came across this very, very positive affirmation, which was may peace prevail on earth. Very, very simple. And this is what actually inspired me because it is so simple. It's all embracing. It, it includes everyone. So I just thought I've, this was a, a last minute thing that I thought of when I was listening to your contributions. Could we just take one moment to visualize how you would like the future to be? What is a short, so if you could compile a short affirmation for yourself. You know, something like, oh, the world is full of um, happy, free, creative and joyful people or anything. Thank you. May peace prevail on earth. Truly, truly. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Caroline. And so now Ellen McAteer will read Hiroshima, Hiroshima, 1945. Thank you, everybody. I feel quite moved as well. Um, it's an honour to read at, at this event with all of these speakers and poets, particularly Jerry Luce, who attended demonstrations against nuclear, you know, against nuclear bombs with my parents, and I went as a small child. Um, and um, now uh, my parents gave me these books, one of which the poem I'm going to read is based on, of, of eyewitness accounts, um, Nagasaki 1945 by Akizuki and um, Hiroshima by Hershey. Um, and uh, I've now passed these on to my son, Finn, who is actually studying the effects of uh, nuclear bombs that hit Hiroshima and Nagasaki as part of his, of all things, physics project. Uh, my son, Charlie, is also studying Japanese. So I have hope for the next generation that they will carry on the work that all of you have done. Um, so uh, reading from, from this poem, Hiroshima 1945, Hiroshima 1945. 
August was a series of burning days, but this was a new light. A rose in the sky, burning crimson. A noiseless flash cut across the land, it seemed a sheet of sun. Sorry. <laughs> Mrs Nakamura took a single step towards her sleeping children when something lifted her. She seemed to fly into the next room over the raised sleeping platform pursued by parts of the house. Waking in the dark, she held a child cry mother, saw tiny Mirko buried to her breast, clawed her way towards her baby, no sound or sight of her other children. Dr. Fuji sat down cross-legged on his porch to read the Osaka news. The flash to him was yellow, sudden as paint in water. He got to his feet. Behind his rising, the hospital yawned with a ripping sound into the river. Then he was swimming among its remains. Father Kleinsorger took off his clothes except his underwear, stretched out to read his Stimmen der Zeit in his bedroom, saw the terrible flash of a meteor hitting earth and went out of his mind for a few minutes. Then he was in the vegetable garden in his underclothes, bleeding slightly from small cuts, the building's gone. Dr. Terufumi Sasaki was one step behind the open window when the light, like a giant photo flash, was reflected on the wall. Sasaki, gambare, be brave, he said, dropping to one knee. The glasses flew from his face. The bottle of blood crashed against one wall. The slippers zipped out from under his feet. Hiroshima spread like a burning fan between its seven estuaries. The sloping streets of Koi were waterfalls of black smoke. Drops of water the size of marbles began to fall. Trees, leafless skeletons, scattered clothing suspended from telegraph wires. Mrs. Nakamura made the wreckage fly above the crying voices, found an intricate mosquito net carefully wrapped around the feet of her son Toshio on top of his sister Yaeko under the wreckage. Bound like twins in a womb, not a single cut or scratch. Others not so lucky supported each other up the hill. Women with bra straps and suspenders imprinted in negative on their naked skin since white repelled and black absorbed this terrible sunburn. The priest vomited constantly. The doctor asked, why is it night already? The heat fused mica on the granite gravestones. How can this happen in a world of God? Mrs. Nakamura asked the priest as the doctor struggled to get her son's temperature down by one degree. Found as he tried to give a drip that victims did not stop bleeding once the needle was in, keltoid tumours swelling like pink silk on their skin. Man is not now in the state that God intended, was the, police, was the priest's reply. The new newspapers said, much damage done. Sasaki was afraid at last. The censors had never admitted so much. The blue ocean can turn into a mulberry field. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And now I'm asking David Mackenzie, the Assistant Secretary of Scottish CND, for his personal reflections. Thank you, Lynn. I believe it's really important in all the multiple crises that we face uh, today and also reflections on past horrors and atrocities that we connect to, if we can, to the humanity and others. And a memory came into my head, which was about 20 years ago, shores of Loch Long, just outside the Coalport base, we had a camp and we wanted to float lanterns on the water of Loch Long in commemoration of the spirits of those lost in Nagasaki. Trouble was, there was an onshore wind and we no way we could get them into the water until somebody had the idea of asking the Ministry of Defence to help. So the boatmen of the Ministry of Defence came down, came into shore and some of us waded out with the lanterns and the boatmen received these lanterns with incredible respect and understanding a, and helped them to float all the way down the loch. It's something I've never forgotten and as I say I would repeat we have to find ways of connecting to the humanity and others. 
I'm now going to introduce a minute of silence. The words are wonderful, but we need the silence reflection as well. I'll introduce it and finish it with a bell. Thank you, David. And I'm now asking Akiko Haga of Edinburgh CND to say a few words to us in Japanese and English on behalf of Edinburgh CND. Thank you. The mayor of Nagasaki made a speech this morning and he said as a message from Nagasaki, Nagasaki o saigo no hibakuchi ni. That means make Nagasaki is the last place destroyed by an atomic bomb. Hiroshima is named as a first place destroyed by an atomic bomb, but it's totally up to us to make Nagasaki to be the last one. He also quoted a word from a survivor. He said, Genbaku no jigoku ikinobita watashi tachi wa kakuheiki no nai heiwa o kakunin shite kara shinitai. That means, survived through the hell. I want to die after witnessing the peace without nuclear weapons. I want to hear the news of the total abolish, abolition of nuclear weapons before hearing the news of the death of last survivor. It might be a challenge because already the average of the survivor, average of the age of survivor is already 83. Yasuraka ni nemutte kudasai. Ayamachi wa krikaishimasen kara. This is a word on the Hiroshima's monument. It means, please sleep peacefully. We won't make mistake again. So just, we have to work hard to at least to let them sleep peacefully. Thank you. Thank you, Akiko. And so now I'm asking Patrick Harvey, MSP and member of the cross-party group on nuclear disarmament to give us his personal reflections, Patrick. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to contribute to this evening's um, reflection. I was, uh, I was struggling a little to think what on earth I could say. Uh, and I was trying to think back and ask myself, when was it that I learned of what had happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And when was it I came to realize how real those events were, how real that atrocity was. Because like a lot of children, I think uh, reading of, of history and, and learning in school feels a little abstract. And uh, even the, the distance of a few decades can make something feel like ancient history. The fact that these images were black and white made it feel even more abstract, difficult to relate to. Uh, my experience of, of learning about nuclear weapons was a little different than most. Some of my earliest memories are being pushed along in a pram on a CND demo by my mum and dad, being sent to school uh, in a hand-knitted jumper with a big CND logo on it that my mum had made. 
and mums being mums, that jumper was a couple of size too big. You'll grow into it. So that CND logo, I'm sure, was bigger than my head. And on more than one occasion, uh, I remember uh, putting paper lanterns into the River Leven uh, to reflect on and remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But when did it really become real for me? I think it was in 1980 when the leaflets and some clips of the television broadcasts from the government information series Protect and Survive were leaked. And so I would like, if I may, to read a little piece from uh, that leaflet. And this is advice to people uh, who have survived the blast. They're in the fallout shelters, if you can call them that. You may have casualties from an attack, which you will have to care for, perhaps for some days, without medical help. Be sure you have your first aid requirements in your survival kit. Listen to your radio for information about the services and facilities as they become available and about the types of cases which are to be treated as urgent. If a death occurs while you are confined to the fallout room, place the body in another room and cover it as securely as possible. Attach an identification. You should receive radio instructions on what to do next. If no instructions have been given within five days, you should temporarily bury the body as soon as it is safe to go out and mark the spot. And those last comments, add an identification and mark the spot, I think were what made it strike home for me that this was real, that this was advice to people the government knew would not survive. That's why they had to add the identification. That's why they had to mark the spot. And it struck me with horror, and it still does, that decades after they'd seen what had happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were still contemplating to doing, doing this to us decades later. So I just wanted to share that as the moment that that moment in history became real to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. So now Jean Rafferty will read Nagasaki 1946. Hi there. Um, I'm from uh, Dovetails, who use the arts um, to oppose nuclear weapons, all kinds of weapons. This poem is just one of many um, which are on uh, our website. That's www.dovetailsscotland.co.uk. Uh, the poem's called Nagasaki 1946. Path erupting with rubble, months after the bomb. Careful, says my mother. Hand out to grip me when I trip on loose stones. The water is clear in the harbour. Violet flowers poke through boulders. Oh, soon, I think. Come soon. My stomach aches with waiting. Hills in the distance slope down to the water, peaceful as sleeping dogs. But in the harbour, strange gelatinous creatures come floating to the surface. Grotesque, deformed, tumours bursting through slimy, translucent skin. Just baby jellyfish, says Oma San. Don't be a silly girl. But I have seen these monstrous faces before. They swim in my dreams, burrow into my brain when I sleep. Please don't be one of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. And now Arthur West, who's the chair of Ayrshire CND, will give us a reflection from Ayrshire CND. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Lynn, and thanks for the, the opportunity to make a contribution to the event. Uh, over the last um, few days, uh, Ayrshire CND have held a couple of short vigils on Friday to commemorate Hir Hiroshima Day in the Dean Country Park in Kilmarnock. And um, today we had a, a short vigil in, in, on, on, on Irvine Beach. And uh, at the vigil, there's been a number of uh, readings and, and reflections. 
And one of the readings uh, that was highlighted at um, the, the vigil on Friday was uh, some remarks from William Jai Perry, who was the US Secretary uh, of Defense from February 1994 to uh, January 1997. And uh, in 2007, uh, William Jai Perry created the Nuclear Security Project to promote the case for a nuclear weapons free world. And in his book, it's a remarkable book, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink, uh, Perry makes the, the following points, which I think make a compelling case against nuclear weapons. And the view in Ayrshire CND, and I'm sure this is a view across the peace movement, that you know you use occasions like this to sort of redouble your, your as a base for redoubling your efforts to get rid of nuclear weapons um, from our world. So in, in the book, and Perry might not always, his background may not have suggested he would eventually take uh, the view that he did, but in his book he says, and so it is today, facing the danger from nuclear weapons is daunting, but we must recognize the threat and devote ourselves to diminishing it. To be sure, as long as nuclear weapons are deployed by nations as part of their war plans, we can never be certain that they will not be used in a regional war or by a terror group. Even a single, single nuclear detonation would entail casualties 100 times greater than those suffered in 9-11. Beyond that, there would be economic, political and social consequences that would destroy our way of life. But we can take the actions that greatly reduce the probability of such a catastrophe and taking these actions should become our highest priority. We must do everything in our power to ensure that nuclear weapons will never be used again. Thank you, Arthur. And I'm now inviting Richard Leonard, MSP, who's also a member of the Cross-Party Group on Nuclear Disarmament, to give his personal reflections. Richard. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, a few years ago, I came across a, a remarkable speech to the Labour Party conference in the late 1970s by the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Philip Noel Baker. And uh, I thought tonight I would read uh, an extract from that speech. Hiroshima, August the 6th, 1945, 8.15am. A lovely summer day, sunshine, blue sky. Blue sky is for happiness in Japan. The streets are full of people, people going to work, people going to shop, smaller people going to school. The air raid siren sounds, but no one goes to shelter. There is only a single aircraft in this enemy raid. It steers a course across the city, above the center. Something falls, it falls and falls, 20 seconds, 30, 40. Then there is a sudden searing flash of light, brighter and hotter than a thousand suns. Those who were watching had their eyes burnt in their sockets. They never looked on men or things again. In the street below are people watching. Suddenly, they are not there. They simply vanish, utterly consumed by the furnace of the bomb. Tens of thousands more Sheltered from the flash by walls and buildings are driven mad by the intolerable heat, by a raging thirst. They run in headlong panic to the seven rivers on which Hiroshima is built. They fight and struggle to reach the water's edge. If they succeed, they stoop to drink the poisoned stream and in a month, they too will die. Then comes the blast, thousands of miles an hour, for two kilometers, every building, every structure leveled to the ground. Lorries, cars, men and women, babies, prams, picked up and hurled like bullets a hundred meters through the air. The blast piles its victims in great heaps in the corners of the street. Seven or eight layers of corpses deep. Then the fireball touched the earth and scores of conflagrations fanned by tornado winds were swept into a single firestorm. Many scores of thousands more, trapped by walls of flame that leapt higher than the highest tower in town, 
swiftly or in longer agony were burnt to death. Then everything went dark. The mushroom cloud rose to the vault of heaven. It carried with it many thousand tons of poison dust, the deadly fallout. The fallout came down and covered everything in Hiroshima, not already rendered lethal. And so those who had escaped, the flash, the river, the blast, the fire, were doomed to die of radioactive sickness in a shorter or a longer time. That was the first atom bomb. It weighed less than five pounds. It killed 200,000 people on the spot. Today in Hiroshima, many, many young adults who were only embryos in their mother's wombs when the bomb exploded have leukemia and will die. Babies are being born who in a short term are doomed to die. It is time that the wars, the ritual sacrifices on the shrine of Moloch were forever ended and the greatest of our socialist tasks is now to try. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And our next speaker, apologies, I should have rehearsed how to pronounce your name correctly, but I'm going to say you, Aoki, from the northeast of Scotland, CND, and perhaps you can correct that, who is going to give us Shigaru's story. Thanks, Flynn. Um, it was close. Uh, my name is Yu Aoki, so um, yeah. Um, so thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to give a reflection. Um, today, I would like to give a short um, talk uh, as a citizen of Japan and as a citizen of uh, Hiroshima and as a citizen of, um, sorry, um, as a third generation of atomic bomb survivors, uh, because both of my uh, grandparents were there when the bomb was uh, dropped and they both survived. Um, and therefore I'm here uh, to give you a speech. Today, I would like to introduce a true story about the tragedy of Hiroshima. And it's a story of a boy called Shigeru. On 6th of August, 1945, it was a very beautiful morning with no cloud in the sky and people had a relaxing start of the day. Suddenly, people saw a strong flash and surrounded by the dazzling white, white light. Everybody held their breath. At that moment, the city of Hiroshima exploded. It was as if the sun fell from the sky. Buildings and houses were knocked down on the ground. The clothes were burned, the skins were, skins were burned, hair was burned, and people gathered around the river, asking with their weak voices, water, water, give me water. They died there and lots of corpses were piled up along the river. Shigeru was a 13 year old boy whose father was a dentist and he also dreamed to be a dentist when he grows up. However, at that time, the war situation didn't allow him to study and he had to engage in war-related construction work. In the morning of August 6, his mother, Shigeko, saw him off when he left for the construction site. Shigeko passed him a little lunch box filled with rice, barley, and soybeans, and Shigeru waved his hand to his mom with smiles. This turned out to be the last time she saw her son alive. After the atomic bomb was dropped later in the morning, Shigeko searched his son for three days and finally found him in the early morning on the 9th of August. Her son was bad, badly burned and mostly only the bones were left. When she found him, Shigeru was lying holding tightly the lunchbox she gave him. Shigeko burst into tears and told his son, you didn't manage to have lunch mom made for you, did you? This was the moment the normal everyday life for Shigeko and Shigeru was gone for good. The lunch was carbonized because of the heat of the bomb. 
and was later donated to the Peace Memorial Museum in Hiroshima by his family for this tragedy, tragedy to be not forgotten. When people talk about nuclear weapons, they talk about how effective they are as a means of defending a country. But they rarely think about the actual consequences of using them. The story of Shigeru speaks about the consequences. A consequence is that the bomb takes away the lives of normal people leading normal daily lives like us. It burns the bodies of normal people. It kills people located far away from the hypocenter by exposing them to radiation carried by wind and rain. And it causes damage to fetuses of pregnant mothers who are exposed to radiation. This is what it means to use nuclear weapons. And Shigeru's story is only one story out of the stories of 210,000 people who died because of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We cannot change the world overnight, but it is possible for each of us to imagine what it means to use nuclear weapons and make continuous efforts and choices to reduce them. Today, my thoughts are with people who lost their lives in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the victims of the ongoing conflicts across the world. Hiroshima, never again. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're returning to Jerry Luce, who will give us a, a second reading. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my second reading is based more, I guess, on hope and the notion I share with Alan McIntyre, and I'm sure all of you, that there is hope in our younger generations. Um, we do what we can, we each do what we can in time, but it's been long more than 70 years since we've been trying to introduce peace into the world. Um, I believe also that wars start when we regard other people's children and other people as lesser than ourselves and act accordingly. It can lead to the atrocities, atrocities like Hiroshima Nagasaki. So I read uh, four short poems kind of based on where I left off. How? How can I say it? One of the Hibakusha said. Why I went to Fast Lane. From the boot of the car, I took out the chainsaw and petrol can, as well as the hand axes and the mall. You never know what the police might object to at Fastlane. I was at Fastlane because I have spoken to survivors of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I was at Fastlane because in New Mexico and Nevada, I have spoken to victims of fallout from atomic and nuclear testing. I was at Fastlane because my uncle died early a witness to atomic bomb testing at Bikini Atoll. I was there to remember these people. I was there to protest at weapons of mass destruction. In Scotland, yes, but lethal for all the world. Afterwards, to clear my thoughts, as I do when memory overwhelms, I went into Glen Fruin above Fastlane and watched a Navy frigate come into birth. I met an old man on a bicycle and a mallard drake sitting in the road. I also picked up some rocket hand-fired para-illuminating flares from war games in the Glen. I hope they will become museum artifacts, curios of a time when we were insane. I hope the old man on the bicycle made it to the top of the hill. I'm for the younger generations. Daughter. With the full of moon, the ocean due west to Newfoundland humps its back, an old dog on a bone, bears mohair teeth, coral teeth, Clifton teeth, clue, Claire and achel teeth to empty black sod sockets. Flow tides, my own daughter's smile, solid as only the sea singing moon. As moon resembles moon as moon replaces moon she passes on bones 
I am here with her shining face in the rock pool on the curling dog Atlantic lip. And sun. How cleanly we step into air. Cattle file across the hill. The hump I climb to watch Aaron float below Nimbus, this single place. This we know we have realized together. Sinister things mount the finger now. We misconceive from our world abuse. We hallucinate them. They batter the insides of our eyelids. The wheel rolls onto us as we dream of purpose, as if there is a purpose of dreams, as if this is the purpose, as if affirming clear air, as if air existed, as if we could hold it, fill our lungs and speak. And because I think art, poetry in particular is an articulation of hope and maybe possible, a possible way to help. I want to read a poetic manifesto which I wrote for a dead friend um, who believed in love. Each poem is a declaration of love, of love for the world, of love for the people of the world. Each poem is in solidarity with the peoples of the planet. Each poem is an expression of compassion for the suffering of the peoples of the world. Each poem is a small act of civil disobedience. Each poem is an insurrection in the face of violence. Even when a poem is explicit in its condemnation of abuses of power, it is coming from that position of compassion. When a poem is denouncing war, it is speaking from a position of strength and love for the peoples of the world. When a poem catalogues atrocities, it is the alternative pillar of shared common humanity. When a poem speaks truth to corruption and to demagogues, it has a greater courage. When a poem speaks to the other than human, it has greatest courage. No poem stands alone. No poem stands apart from its culture. No poem stands isolated from its people. Its people are the dispossessed. Its people are the abused. Its people are the murdered. Its people are the beloveds of poems. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. So now I ask Isabel Lindsay, who's one of our vice chairs of Scottish CND, for her personal reflection. When I was a very young child, I had a little kimono. I had a Japanese doll. In our sideboard, there was a half melted green Japanese beer bottle. Uh, a number of other mementos, if one can call them that, of, of uh, in effect, uh, uh, Hiroshima and the fact that my father had been with British forces who'd gone into Hiroshima uh, after the bomb had been dropped. They were billeted some way out of the city with uh, local families. Uh, my mother kept a pair of my father's socks that the Japanese women he'd been billeted with had gardened uh, so beautifully. So I learned firsthand about nuclear weapons, about what had happened. So it was a reality in that sense for me. But when you read about all the decision-making, all the politicking around the decisions to drop the bombs, it's Hannah Arendt's well-known phrase about the banality of evil that comes to mind. Uh, the targeting committee that made the decisions made up of senior American politicians and military personnel, uh, they did consider Kyoto, but because one of them had in the 1920s been on holiday in Kyoto, and he said he thought it would be a great pity to destroy all the temples. Uh, 
Nagasaki wasn't the intended target. It was another city, um, but when they flew over it, uh, it was very, very cloudy. So they just drove on, flew on to Nagasaki and bombed it instead. It's all these things which show the capacity human beings have to separate their actions from consequences. And our job as a peace movement is to try to bring these together again and to say, we cannot give a handful of people in the world the power to destroy civilization as we know it. And unless we can instill this feeling of personal responsibility and this insistence that we must take this power away from that handful of people, then we are going to be at those one or two minutes from midnight. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And now I'm going to ask Tom Hubbard to read Three Etudes of the Key of Green. Three Etudes of the Key of Green. This poem in Scots was written when I was active in CND uh, during the 1980s, the era of cru cruise missiles of Greenham Common, Thatcher and Reagan, and the arrival of Gorbachev and the explosion at Chernobyl, Chernobyl in Ukrainian. The poem appeared in a magazine later that year, 1986. Um, three illusions, um, I should explain. Um, the, the poem opens with a question that was put at the time, at the time in 1986 by, I think, a scientist when he, he asked, if we couldn't deal with this, how could we deal with that? There's also a reference to the colours red and green. Um, and this was a time when East German dissidents were calling for a new coming together of green and democratic socialist politics. Also to the mock execution to which the novelist Dostoevsky was subjected. Three etudes in the key of green. One. Can we couldn't deal with this? Who could we deal with on? An again dome is kettled with the sun's licht. There's another day, an icon for to kiss, the shots to expect, though the horseman galloped on. Dostoevsky thought that glow his final sicht. Two, the world gone grey, all grey, save the blackened twist of the leaven while hang to thee, the the hindmiss ribble stashed on history's cairn. And that's no yet, and e'en new could be missed, spring eighty sacks has the horror we canna see, that blicks the grace of the corpo of cancer bairn. Three, Unlock our brain jail with a key of green, the rhythms of the sap and of the blood, and verdant married to ver vermilion. Or what so gladden our in, as we bide here manacled when the domes of death explode in unison. Thank you, Tom. So now we've got a short recorded contribution from the Renfrewshire CND commemoration event. Hello. Here in Paisley CND and in wider Renfrewshire, we've been commemorating the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki for over 40 years now. On many occasions, the event has taken place in the beautiful walled garden of Barshaw Park, which was dedicated as a peace garden by Bruce Kent on a visit to the west of Scotland back in 1986. Also, last week, we looked out a family photograph of a, another memorable occasion when Paisley CND commemorated the event 
um, by sailing little paper boats down the river cart uh, at the water mill in Paisley. We have commemorated these events under the moral conviction that it is totally unjustifiable to threaten to obliterate entire cities and to permanently pollute the planet with nuclear weapons. In the past year, the world has passed two major landmarks. Firstly, countries across the world are now accepting that man's activities are in danger of threatening the climate of the planet through the burning of fossil fuels. It is clear that we cannot add nuclear pollution to this threat. At the COP26 conference in Glasgow in November, many countries are sure to press for internationally binding laws to limit planet warming. Secondly, earlier this year, the United Nations Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Treaty has been ratified, as more than 50 countries across the world have signed up. So, as a species, we're coming a bit closer to accepting legally as well as morally that we must modify our activities. We're coming to realise that we must respect the planet and all its biodiversity if we are all to survive. Here in Scotland, we will continue to put pressure on this country to recognise its legal obligation to keep our planet safe. Thank you. Thank you for that. So now we're going to turn to Chris Nicholl, who is going to read Hiroshima Anniversary. Hello everyone. Hiroshima Anniversary. This is not a poem about Hiroshima. It's not even about 1942 and the US Manhattan Project that developed nuclear weapons detonated the first atomic bomb, Trinity, housed by Jumbo on top of a 30 meter steel tower in the hot, flat Honado del Muerto desert of Alamogordo, New Mexico. It's not about the fireball, visible 60 miles away, or blast crater, five feet by 30 feet, nor radioactivity that contaminated dust. Nor is it about the morning of the 6th of August 1945, or Little Boy, of detonation 1900 feet above the city, the bomb surface 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, or about the blinding boiling light, instant incineration within 1600 feet. Neither is it about scorched shadows bleached into stone, walls, buildings, pavements, a man with a cane sitting on steps of Sumitomo Bank, a child at play, eerie evidence of human detritus that once were citizens. And it's certainly not about the nuclear winds that ripped through buildings across play areas, parks, in speed of 60 miles per second, fanning flames of secondary fires, or wooden houses burnt two kilometres from the epicentre, or that air currents formed clouds, released black rain, eagerly licked up by parched survivors because water supplies had evaporated. This is not about the animals, dogs, cats, sheep, goats, cows, or birds that incinerated on the wing, or poisons that polluted the earth, the water, the people, or what we call civilization. No, not even close. This is a poem about the indomitable spirit of survivors, of the voices that still tell the world what it looks like when human beings devise new and terrible ways to destroy each other. It's about peace, about finding ways to live 
without resort to armed conflict, to find that still soft voice within that stays the hand, that guides the heart, that leads to better things, to hope. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And now David Pewter, Chair of Glasgow CND, will read We Are the Human Miracle uh, on behalf of Glasgow CND. David, you, we're not hearing you for some reason. Sorry, can we just hang on a minute? Um, I don't know what's happened to you. Okay, now. Okay, yes. now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. The song I'm going to, to to read you is actually called "We Only Have to Try." It was written by a, a Glasgow school teacher called Ian Davison, and I believe it was the mid 1960s to the late 1960s. He was a prolific songwriter, comic and other songs about Glasgow life and language, love, history and politics. We became interested in folk music when he met Norman Buchan, who was credited with making a major contribution to renewal of interest in Scottish folk music. He was co-founder of SCND Buskers, who wrote songs to sing on anti-nuclear marches and demonstrations and also to raise money for SCND. He was a member of the Glasgow Songwriters Group. One of the songs he wrote was Mordecai Benunu in the jail of Ashkenon. And in the eight, 1980s, I believe he was secretary of SCND. Arthur said that this is a time when we redouble our efforts to get rid of nuclear weapons. Well, this song to me is an inspiration to do exactly that. We can reach our rock and rhythm into every city and street. We can mix the mood and the music for a million dancing feet. We can save the dying children with our pictures from the sky. We can make ourselves take action and we only have to try. Yes, we are the human miracle with our magic in the sky. We can save ourselves and save the world and we only have to try. We can bend the shining river to give every field a stream. We can bind the soil together. We can grow the desert green. We can gather plants and the creatures and the earth and the sea and the sky. We can use the world more wisely, and we only have to try. Yes, we are the human miracle with our magic in the sky. We can save ourselves and save the world, and we only have to try. We can build a peace with justice. We can turn bombs into bread. We can step back from the cliff top where the nuclear hawks have led. We can fix ourselves a future, not a missile in the sky. We can tame our fears and the profiteers, and we only have to try. Yes, we are the human miracle with our magic in the sky. We can save ourselves and save the world, and we only have to try. Thank you for that, David. And thank you for reminding us about Ian Davidson's lyrics. So now I'm turning to Janet Fenton, uh, also Vice Chair of Scottish CND, for the final contribution. Janet. Well, um, what a powerful collection of contributions and reflections we've had this evening. And uh, um, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, this morning I had my breakfast and it was particularly tasty and I really appreciated it because I'm one of a group of people that uh, for a few years now have had a habit of fasting between the time of the Hiroshima bomb and the 
the time of the Nagasaki one. And I'm not suggesting that the little bit of discomfort that arises from doing that kind of fast is, is um, in any way comparable, but, but it does somehow take you down into a place where, where you become very aware of our physical reliance on the planet and its gifts of food and water for our survival. And somehow in that place, there's a possibility of, of really looking at the, the, the awful, awful contemplation of what inhumanity can do in terms of what, what some people can choose to do to other people. Um, which, when it runs amok, uh, ends up with as the, these kind of situations. And there's been quite a lot of chat tonight about the Hiroshima book by John Hersey, and that was certainly my point of entry into a realisation of nuclear weapons. And I was very young, I was about 12 or 13, and uh, 13 or 14 maybe, when, when I went to a poetry reading where somebody read excerpts from that book as as happened earlier and uh, the effect that it had on me was that we needed to we needed to make these things illegal we needed to ban them they needed to be removed from the possibility of any any kind of use and uh, and that's still my view and um, so a, a, a big issue for me in terms of my activity has been working over the years towards the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which I think brings great hope for all of us. Um, I'm thinking tonight that we're, we're part of a community. It's great that we have these MSPs here and that they, I'm looking forward to the, the first official meeting of the new parliaments We've had one cross-party group meeting, but it wasn't official. So the official one is on the 21st of September. But I'm aware of all the campaigners, of all the academics, of all the faith groups, and most of all of the people that were, have been directly affected by the bombs and by the tests. And uh, so, I mean, we've we've had some amazing reflections tonight and had a chance to, to really face up to the awfulness of these things. So I think we also need to, in a way, go easy on ourselves. And David's contribution was, was wonderful from that point of view. It was such a good uh, and timely reminder of our human capacity for change. And uh, so I thought as a, a, a kind of closing, I, I have a, a poem by Charles Colesley, who's one of my favorites. Um, and it's quite short and it's a, a really good reminder that we are all interconnected, that we can only do what we can do with our own human hands and that we're all somehow connected to each other and to the planet. So, um, we had uh, the bell that David Mackenzie rang for our moment's reflection. Uh, we, we use a bell in our local Quaker meeting and I'm, I'll, I'll say this poem and then I'll ring the bell um, and hope that that's a nice closure for our evening. It's called I Am The Song by Charles Cosley. I am the song that sings the bird. I am the leaf that grows the land. I am the tide that moves the moon. I am the stream that halts the sand. I am the cloud that drives the storm. I am the earth that lights the sun. I am the fire that strikes the stone. I am the clay that shapes the hand. I am the word that speaks the man.